All right, good evening, good evening, good evening. Welcome to the Kansas City Public School Board Policy Monitoring Workshop for October 13, 2021. We will call this meeting to order. June, will you please call the roll? Mr. Barca? Present. Ms. Buckner? Here. Ms. Cortez? Here. Ms. Ford? Yes. yes. Hi. I heard you. Dr. Jones? <laughs> um, Ms. Wolfsey? Sorry, yes. Mr. Hogan? Here. I wonder if Ms. Ford is on. Um, <laughs> wow. Um, apologies for, <laughs> for that. Um, all right. Is there a motion to approve the agenda as stated? So moved. Second. All right, June, will you please call the roll? Mr. Abarca? Yes. Ms. Buckner? Yes. Ms. Cortez? Yes. Ms. Ford? Yes. Oh, it's per perfect. <laughs> Great to speak. Dr. Jones? Yes. Ms. Wolfsey? Yes. Mr. Hogan? Yes, the motion passes, the agenda is approved. All right. Well, let's uh, get right into this. As, as you guys probably know, we're going through uh, redistricting um, for lots of jurisdictions, but specifically the Kansas City Public Schools. Um, I want to welcome um, our Kansas City Election Board Commissioner, Lori Elam, and ask her to come to the podium and just give us an update on where we are with, uh, with the redistricting process. And then we'll have some Q&A if, if folks are interested and have additional questions. Welcome Certainly. and thank you. Good afternoon or good evening. Uh, it's been a long day, but I'm glad we're all here together. And it's nice to finally meet uh, people that I've spoken with numerous times on the phone, but have never met. Um, first of all, I'd like to say thank you to the Kansas City, Missouri School District um, for allowing us to use the schools. If we did not use the schools last year, we would not have been successful at all. Um, it allowed us not only to keep the poll workers safe, but the voters. Uh, and us, we're the only election authority in the state that did not have an outbreak. So I attribute that to your assistance. I appreciate that. Well, it's this time again. Uh, last time we did the redistricting process, it was in 2018. So I just kind of want to go over briefly the schedule that we've outlined. Um, the first public hearing is this Friday at noon here. And what we did is we put out press releases. It's on the city's website, it's on our website. Um, and I'm sure you all did some of the same items, but basically the first meeting 
is simply to show the maps that we got from the planning and logistics department of the city with the new census data on it. So then what they're gonna do is gather feedback from the team. And then we're gonna come back with five maps after that. That's for the second public hearing. So then we present the five maps that we've come up with based on the information um, that you all will discuss on Friday. And then um, they'll gather feedback once again. We thought it was easier uh, in working with Bill for all of the meetings to be here. Uh, that way it can be consistent. Um, and we hope that by adding the Zoom feature, uh, it will allow the, the, the voters and the public to, to the parents to be able to participate. Um, next, we do have a big deadline that's on November the 1st. Um, the community must have the map submitted. The reason why that's so important is um, at the final meeting uh, last time, uh, people submitted, were trying to submit maps. So this time I figure if we put it out loud and clear that the maps uh, will be submitted to our website, KCEB, KCEB redistricting um, at kcb.org. Now, the third hearing will be here and that's to present the final three maps. Um, we're gonna gather the feedback. We're gonna take that back to the board. And essentially, I'm not the, I, I, I like saying this part, I'm not the person that is the decision maker here. I'm just the facilitator and the coordinator of all the activities. Um, actually, the planning and uh, the city planning department has agreed this time to assist us again with the map. So that's very helpful because we were, uh, initially it was gonna be that we were gonna have to bring ourselves up to speed with the software um, because they weren't gonna be able to assist us. But um, our friends at the city decided to assist us because by law, we have to do this for you all. And we're here to do the best job that we can. Um, it's imperative um, that we stick to the timeline. Um, at our website, we have everything. We have pop-ups that we've already added to our site. In addition, the KCPS um, redistricting email address, I've already started getting emails. Uh, the consultants, and, and that's a good thing. I, I, I know it's like a little bit early, but that's a good thing because last time I can count, we had nine um, emails the entire time during the redistricting process. So uh, do you all have any questions for me? Thank you, Ms. Elam. Ms. Wolfsey. Um, I don't know if it's necessarily a question. I just want to make sure I know we're hosting all three with the Zoom. And, and as I've watched meetings here on Zoom, I just want to make sure we're help. We've got communication going with you about since you're going to be showing maps and things like that that we'll be working closely with you guys so that people online can maybe see those in a share screen sort of environment. Just that's gonna be key, I think, to getting good feedback in this process. Yes, uh, the consultants um, are gonna be here as well and they will share the screens. We also have, we'll have an update continuously, uh, the maps on our website as well. And um, yes, so the answer is yes, we will do, we will do so. And, and we'll also pass out comment cards. That's a huge thing. Some people don't do emails like we do. So we don't wanna assume that. Um, so we will pass out comment cards and my secretary uh, from the board, they will also be attending to take minutes because that's what I spent the last, what, four months is looking over redistricting notes, trying to be better than we, um, and get it out to the public better than we did last time. Any additional questions? Mr. Barca? Uh, I think, more a comment about thank you, first of all, for all the hard work you do. I know that election authorities have come under fire lately, um, and, and we are glad to have you in this position to help navigate these interesting times. Thank you. Um, I think for the, the public's sake, this is incredibly imperative to get involved and engage in this process. Having been involved in the last redistricting process, um, and being one of the four people who showed up to all three sessions, um, it, is, thank you. it is truly important to be present, be engaged, look at the maps, understand the boundaries and all the different components that come into making these decisions. Because without the community's input, we're drawing lines and picking things based upon our best guesses uh, and, and research, but we need the community to participate and double down on the things that we're doing. So thank you for your work and a call to the community to come out and participate. Absolutely. And we've added it also to our Facebook, Twitter, 
um, to all our forms of social media. So because that's typically how people reach out to us. They don't really want to email us. They, they do it on Facebook. So um, we've already started answering those questions and, and directing people to the right place. Any further questions? Well, I think I'm only... very accessible. So if anybody needs me, feel free to call me uh, about redistricting at any time. So Thank just you. to reiterate, Ms. Elam, that the, yes. the next meeting is October 15th at noon here in the Board of Education and will also be available via Zoom. So that is correct. Yep. Okay. And it's already been posted. Great. Thank you. Appreciate You're it. You're welcome. Thank you. All right. Well, with that, June, let's do a quick review of um, current action items. Screen. There it is. There we go. Oh, oh, that okay. is an eye chart. It is an eye chart, but um, at this point, all of them except for the staff have been. Sorry. At this point, all of the um, open the action items have been responded to, except the one request for the DAC parents' names and addresses. The last one on the screen. That one is being resolved this um, next week. We're waiting on principals on that one. Got it. Any questions from the board? All right. Thank you, Jim. With that being said, Dr. Bell will turn it over to you for the superintendent report. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, we want to uh, go over a couple of items under the superintendent's report. Uh, the first is being a quick announcement, and, and this is just an announcement around communication um, <clears throat> to our families and community members. You know, as a school district, we're a pretty large school district, um, you know, servicing over 14,000 pre-K through 12 students in this school district. And I know that in the midst of, of, of trying to ensure that we can get questions answered, get concerns addressed, you know, I want to make sure that, 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 that our, our folks know how to best reach us. Um, and I think here's a path and we will make sure that all of this information is posted on our website so it's easy for people to um, get some of these concerns addressed. But we always talk about things that happen in the classroom. Generally, you know, we want our parents to address those concerns with a teacher. They're not able to get that answer. You move to the building principal. You're not able to get an answer from the building principal. We have an ombudsman. And I'll leave that number with people in a few minutes. Our ombudsman handles uh, complaints and concerns and any inquiries across this district on a daily basis. If it's not resolved at that level, it goes to assistant superintendents and those assistant superintendents are assigned over our schools. They generally work closely with the building principals to help support and then to the superintendent from there. I think, um, the superintendent is very easy. Um, you know, we have a Let's Talk um, app that people can, can go to and they're able to easily make contact with me as a superintendent. Uh, we have a certain amount of time that we have to respond. Uh, that generally, that, that information is filtered to the appropriate individuals and we will get concerns addressed. Um, and we do want all of our families to know and constituents within this school district, we take any of your inquiries seriously. Um, and so our ombudsman number is 816-418-7000. Um, and, 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 and I think the big thing here is we're, we're going through a pandemic right now. I think there's a lot of just emotional anxiety that we all are facing as a country. There's a lot of stress and a lot of uncertainty. And I know that people want answers right away. And, as, and look, we want to be able to give you those answers right away, but there are times where we have to investigate, we have to look into these situations, but I will assure you that as we work to address these inquiries, we will do it with our due diligence, but there is a chain and if we follow that, I think we can get a lot more done. At the end of the day, if, if people, if the superintendent hasn't been able to resolve it, you have seven elected officials that you can then shoot those concerns to and, and I will work through them to make sure that we get it addressed. But I do ask that people give us an opportunity to be able to try to address those. And I think a lot of these things can get solved very easily in most cases. So I just wanna make sure that I'm, I'm making that announcement and just 
reiterating the process and, and, and we're here to support everybody and we're here to, to be an open and honest and transparent school district and we'll continue to operate in that manner. All right, <clears throat> the next item that I wanted to talk to you all about is uh, Blueprint 2030. And we have the engagement sheet um, up and I'm pulling up something real quick um, because I think it's, it's important that I share with everybody around Blueprint 2030. A lot of media uh, attention has uh, taken place over the last 24 hours or so. And we did have an opportunity to sit down and we spoke with multiple media outlets about what we were doing with Blueprint 2030 and the phase that we're getting ready to head into, which is scenarios where we want to be able to come out to this community and talk about what does the future of this school district look like. And it's, it's interesting how, how media entities can take a conversation and the headlines are so different across the board. And some of those headlines can create what I think a, a lot of angst and a lot of worry. And then there are others where it's framed differently around how do we in a very proactive way work to make this the best school district for the kids that live in this city. And I got two of them. One is from the Kansas City Star. And they says, Kansas City may close, consolidate schools after years of enrollment decline. Then you go over to KCUR and, are, and it reads, Kansas City Public Schools seek student and community input on how to improve in the next 10 years. And I think when you read the content of both of them, the content is very aligned because they were all in the room together. And there's also an article from Link. They're all in the room together. So the content absolutely covers what we want to do. And yes, do we talk about consolidations, potential closures, potential co-locations? All of those things are up for discussion, but that is not the reason why we're doing this, right? The reason why we're doing this is because right now, our kids are not being allotted the rich, full-blown comprehensive experiences that they deserve in our school system based on how our school system is set up. And we think that we have an opportunity right now to do something and to go bold and to not be afraid to do something different. Because if the system was working as configured, we wouldn't be in this, have, we would, there's no need to have this conversation right now. Our parents are telling us with the decisions that they're making that we have to do something different. So we have this opportunity. And as we frame this out in the community, we want people to know, yes, we're going to experience some pain. Yes, we're going to experience some discomfort. Yes, there may be some uncertainty, but here's the deal. If not now, then when? When do we get rid of this rigid model that does not serve everybody well? Only pockets of kids are getting a true comprehensive experience as you read in these articles. And I think we have a responsibility and that's not on this board and that's just not on Dr. Bedell and the administration and staff in this district. It's about this community. Y'all have to tell us what it is you want. How far can we go? And then can we have the support from you all to get this district to a place where we can do out of the box stuff? Who says we have to do 720 to 220 for high schools? Why can't we do eight to eight and let kids come in as needed to accommodate to the best of our ability? Why can't we give flexibility in how we educate kids? Because that's the world they're going into now. So I'm hoping that these conversations lead us to a richer experience, a richer dialogue and some level of risk taking. And I'll be the first to tell you, I'm human. I'm nervous about all of this, but I'm excited. I'm excited because I'm thinking about what could be. And if we work together, we can do that, but we can't have divisive clickbait titles that get everybody all worked up and everybody's thinking about it from a negative standpoint, when the reality of what we're trying to do is just give our kids a fair shot. That's all we want. And I think we all owe that to these children, not to continue to sacrifice generations of kids because we continue to educate 
in an antiquated type model. Those days are beyond us. So let's come together and we're asking people to come out. We're gonna start this Blueprint 2030 engagement. We're gonna to continue to do our workshops with the board, our advisory team meetings. I'll continue to keep our union president apprised of where we are, our teacher advisory committee, many of the other advisory committees that I meet with. We're gonna look at school site gallery walks. And here's a couple of dates here. On Monday, October 18th, we'll have gallery walk engagements over at Phillips Elementary. We'll do it again on Tuesday at the Board of Education. We'll do it both virtual um, here and in person, and we'll do it in Spanish. So we'll be able to connect people through link to kind of have an idea of what we want to see happen. Academically, facility-wise, what is the experiences that our kids deserve? On Wednesday, October 20th, we'll do it at Central Middle School um, from five to seven. We'll do it again on Thursday, October 21st, um, 5.30 to 6.30. And then on Friday, October 22nd, we'll do a meeting over at Hellcook to engage the community. This is just the beginning of extensive engagement. There are many groups and organizations and ad hoc committees that we have to meet with. So we ask everybody to just be fully present and show up. Bring five people with you. Get five people to log on. This is your school system. This is not Dr. Bedell's school system. It's not my administrative team system. It's these people that you elected here to serve that live in this community and it's your district. We here to serve you. So we just need to be able to engage you. And I do want everybody to know this. We do not know what schools we're having to close or consolidate or co-locate. That's going to happen as we engage you all. And you're gonna tell us how far we can go. That's it. So that is the update that I wanted to give everybody around Blueprint 2030, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Dr. Bedell. Agree 100% with everything you just said. And I would actually add that we're not even just starting the engagement now, right? We've been engaging for months in a variety of ways. I think we've gotten 1,500 student responses alone. So this is, this is you know, we're being thoughtful, intentional. Uh, the district is about this. The board is going to start getting a lot more engaged um, now in the community as well with some of this, just to make sure that we're hearing voices from all stakeholders across the city. So appreciate the effort you and your team are going through for this. I'll turn it back over to you for, um, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead, yeah, Dr. Jones. Uh, no. no. You sure? Okay. Yeah, because we still have a couple of presentations, so I don't know if you want to oh. say it now. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Um, thank you for uh, your notes. Um, I just had a question kind of about the ombudsman role, because that really intrigues me. I had really heard about a lot about that role for a while. And so I'm curious as to um, how long that role has been in place. And then like, is there a time when we can broadly see some of the information and and metrics uh, about that position, that person who handles because, you know, sometimes we do get concerns from people, um, whether it's about buses or whatever, and we do pass them off to you all. And so just wonder, what are they hearing? And how do they generally resolve and dispatch these issues? I um, mean, just wanting a future note of maybe getting some data back from that position. How, you know, how many calls are they dealing with? How are they resolving them? Not in the weeds, but just, you know. Yeah, so I know that it's he documents every uh, call that he's made. I think we've had the program in place for about five years or so. And, and I know that uh, this per particular position works directly with schools, but not even not only schools, departments. If people are calling in and they need support with trying to uh, get some, some support in a particular department. But I do know that Every single um, person that 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 it encounters the ombudsman is documented, so we have we have that information. But it, they work directly to get those resolved with the different departments and also those respective schools. And I think that's probably about it, right? Yeah. So the report, uh, the ombudsman report. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm Monthly in the Friday update from my division, there's an ombudsman report that outlines his report for the month. So that that report is provided. So um, you'll have the report monthly that shows that information, but that's how we provide the information to the board on the ombudsman. 
I'm, I do see the numbers. I was just meaning like the nature and like in general, how they're resolved. Is it resolved in a week? Is it, okay. you know, you know, just kind of some more, so a little more detail to that report. Just a little bit. Okay. No and maybe just one time for, to kind of understand that. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, I, I think it would, I think it's a good point. Um, we get that data and I can't remember how frequently, but we get that data on let's talk, right? So what types of calls are coming in? I can't remember if we get resolution times, maybe that comes as well. I'm looking at <laughs> Miss Wachel. Um, so it'd be, I think it'd be interesting to understand the medium by which it come, the requests are being logged. So is it the ombudsman, if, et cetera? So maybe that's something to capture just sort, sort of for a future state, um, Jim. Okay, cool. Any other questions for Dr. Bedell before we move on to the Ed Foundation? No? Okay. All right, thank you, Mr. Chair. So we at this time want to provide an update to the board and the community on our education foundation and the progress we've been making with um, this aspect of our school district. So Nicole Collier White is here to take us through this presentation. Thank you, Dr. Bedell. Good evening, Board Chair Hogan, uh, fellow board members, cabinet, and of course, all KCPS stakeholders. Nicole Collier White, Director of the KCPS Education Foundation, excited to come to you today uh, and give a report, our annual report on the state of the foundation. I know we have a few um, new board members that haven't seen our presentation and don't fully understand everything that we do. So I'm excited to share with you our programs, initiatives, and then of course, talk to you about the gains that we've made this school year. So first thing, looking at our board members, we have made some changes. Uh, our new board president is actually Casey Venna from the Country Club Plaza. Um, and then we actually, through natural attrition, have lost a couple of board members this year. So starting in November, we'll be engaging uh, Kansas City stakeholders, um, community members, folks interested in potentially serving on our board. So if you all have some recommendations, suggestions, um, we do have a couple of ex-officios, Ms. Rita Cortez and Nate Hogan on the school board that can kind of take those recommendations and we're going to go through our uh, vetting process to add a few board uh, new board members. So looking at our programs, we have two sides of the house, educational initiatives and impact programs. Those educational initiatives truly align with Dr. Bedell's strategic plan. We meet with him every single year and outline top priorities. How can we serve you? Where can the dollars go to truly make an impact in the classroom? On the other side of the house, we have impact programs. Those are things that are dear and true to the education foundation. For us, dollars need to be as close to students as physically possible. So honestly, 90% of the time we focus on teaching. So that's classroom grants, teacher of the year, summer fest, and then um, wonderful, fun uh, educational grants that go out every single year. So looking at us by the numbers, um, I actually created this position starting in 2016. Dr. Bedell brought me in. Before that, it was a volunteer-led board. Um, so you can see in 2016, we were bringing in about $13,000. Um, last year was a record high. We brought in over $874,000. Um, I will tell you a lot of that is due to COVID relief. A lot of folks open their pockets, um, ask questions about how they can help and support our families and teachers, and that resulted in um, some great gains for us. We also have a couple of pretty big um, funding programs in that through AVID, Middle College, and that's going to constitute a good chunk of that. So we know over the next couple of years, the dollars may average back out to maybe $500,000, $600,000 without those big grants. Um, but we were still excited to see kind of a record high last year. One thing I do want to note, it does look a little funny with the numbers, and that's with the years correlating with the numbers because we changed our fiscal year. So we were operating yearly from January to December, but we felt we needed to go parallel right with the school district to make sure that when we issued checks to teachers or for programs, it aligned with the budgeting system here in the district. So we actually switched to um, uh, June to July. A breakdown of that 800,000 coming through. So you'll see in that first column revenue coming in. So 500,000 of that 874K uh, was restricted. So that's a donor saying it needs to go to this program and needs to go to this initiative. Uh, 46,000 was just our annual campaign general asking. And then you had 320,000 through general donations. People just kind of writing a check through online, just general giving, uh, payroll deduction but honestly a huge chunk of it being restricted. So 
Unfortunately, that means we can't play with that money. If there's a need that comes up, we can't fill the gap. Um, so our goal is to change a little bit of that demographic to where more funds are general and less is restricted. In the middle column, it kind of dictates what we gave out grant-wise to Kansas City Public Schools. So 275,000 was direct KCPS EF program. So that Summerfest Teacher of the Year instructional grants. Uh, and then pass through dollars. So if there's um, a grant or if there's a foundation that specifically wants to fund something within KCPS and they wanna use our 501c3, we conduct that. So that's the pass through. And then 269 was through COVID relief. On the right column, you'll kind of see a breakdown of how the foundation spends their money. 93% of our dollars go directly to Kansas City Public Schools. No other education foundation, probably no other foundation gives that much money directly to who they support. That means we're not doing a lot of marketing. We're not doing a lot of in-house consultants and food and whining and dining donors. We truly give 93% of our dollars directly to Kansas City Public Schools. And it's something we're excited to tell donors about um, and to tell you about today. All right, looking a little further into what we fund, uh, the first thing that you're gonna hear about largely is AVID. That was one of our very first big grants that we received. Uh, the total was $450,000. Last year, we got a big chunk of that money, so over $317,000. We have one more check coming to support AVID, so we're having conversations with the school district on how to maintain that program, whether that's find an outside force source to fund it or find a way to kind of inherit that within the current budget. Uh, next is middle college. So we received a $240,000 grant over three years to support that. That was year one. So we have two more years to support that program. And that's truly just to make sure we can add in more students uh, properly. And instead of having to cap how many students we can serve in middle college. Next is gonna be instructional grants. So this is spring and fall. Um, it was a little tough because we had COVID mid-year and we didn't necessarily know the need of our teachers. We knew sometimes it was gonna be virtual materials. Um, when we came back in person, was it cleaning products? Um, what did teachers need? So we, we just tried to fill as much as we could. Um, we had over a thousand students impacted with that. We gave out over $37,000 and 51 grants total. A lot of those were just 500 bucks. Just can I get a few materials to help me do online classroom? I just want to send my kids some robotics kits. Very small $500 request. And that's why the 51 grants is, is pretty high for that small amount. And then of course, COVID relief. So that covers a lot. There was $350,000 in cash. But below that, you're going to see there was a lot of in-kind support that came in for COVID. 7,000 protective shields. You had 600 uh, COVID tests for athletes. Uh, we had a ton of donors just give um, so we could do like toiletry kits. So whenever families drove through to get their meals, we could also say, hey, do you need soap, shampoo, cleaning products? And we gave all of that out. Um, Patrick Mahomes gave us like three pallets of head and shoulders because that's who sponsors him. So thinking through all of those fun, good things that, that families probably needed. Um, and then of course, through Summerfest, backpacks, school supplies, um, COVID tests, sports physicals, all of the, that good stuff. Um, a little deeper dive into Summerfest 2020 and then 2021, uh, clearly the need was still there for school supplies. Even if you were at home, you still need a backpack. You still need um, someplace to, to write your stuff for notebooks and do homework and all of those good things. So we had a drive through Summerfest last year in the rain. Um, we had about 3,500 participants, 4,500 backpacks given out, five health partners came in and did sports, physicals, immunizations. But in 2021, we chose to still do it a drive through and that uh, attendee number increased by over a thousand. So we had 4,500 families drive through East High School and we gave out 6,000 backpacks, 6,000 school supply sets, um, fewer health partners, but we actually did 105 sports physicals that day and gave out over 50 COVID-19 uh, vaccinations. So we were pretty excited about that attendance. And then looking at community partners, um, we had Cordish that still gives away uh, $50,000 every single year to the foundation. We actually have extended that contract for one more year uh, because of COVID. And then we are still giving away a free two-year apartment lease. So we're getting ready to pull that teacher for the 2022 year in a couple of weeks. Uh, and then a portion of their proceeds from concert sales and classroom support will still go to the district as well. In the middle, um, 
I don't know if it's on your sheets, but it's on, if it's an updated to the PowerPoint, we had a partnership with Charlie hustle this year. Um, thus far we've raised about $3,500 from that sale. They've sold out numerous times. It's kind of the first time they've actually partnered with an education foundation to do it. So it's been really exciting. Um, I actually had orders from charter schools, mind you, that ordered a classroom set for every single teacher in their building even though it had our logo on the back, they still wanted to support the education foundation and have that really cool heart shirt. So everybody and their mom has a shirt now. Uh, and then of course the 2020 state of the schools fair, we held it virtual. We had over 37 uh, tables sold and about $80,000 raised. Finally, um, one thing we've never shown you is actually the impact of the foundation over the past five years that we've kind of generated uh, increased revenue, and it's close to $1.9 million to the school district. This is a number we're extremely proud of. I honestly wasn't sure how quick we were going to be able to generate this kind of income, especially with that first year bringing in only $13,000, but... If you kind of look, the community has really rallied behind us. This is not just a foundation effort. I have to give major kudos to cabinet and uh, KCPS staff. While I am a party of one, they join my party on a daily basis. Uh, they support me, give me contacts, encouragement, brainstorm, support where they need to. Linda's my financial guru when I need her to be. And so really this number is truly because the district has rallied to say we need to find ways to support major initiatives in Kansas City Public Schools and I'm really and truly grateful for Dr. Bedell's leadership support and of course cabinet and his team. Uh, last is of course the state of the school's breakfast that I think all of you attended a couple of years, years, a couple of weeks ago. Um, we held, it feels like years ago, dog years in the district now. Um, so it was a Thursday, September 9th at Kansas City Power and Light. It was wonderful outside. Um, we had a record year. We raised about $103,000 this year, which is wonderful. Sold about 36 tables. Um, so it was a good day. It was nice. A ton of great coverage. A lot of stuff online. Um, honestly, stuff we've never received before. A lot of kudos for Dr. Bedell, his team, and of course our Paseo Choir that performed. So we're just excited to bring that kind of energy and brightness and light to the community. There's a lot of good things going on in our district. A lot of times we don't tell the story. And so our job truly is to shine a light on all the good works that are being done within Kansas City Public Schools. And it's my honor to represent the foundation that does that. Just some goals for 2021, 2022. Um, we are actually working with a team that's gonna do some brand impact awareness. A lot of folks don't know that the district has an education foundation. Outside of the civic and business community, general folks really just don't know. So my job is to make sure they do know and we find ways to engage them and to bring them along in this journey. Uh, we wanna update our five-year plan that runs out in 2023. Uh, we need to increase the number of classroom grants that are given out to our teachers. And we need to increase payroll deduction so that everybody buys in to the goodness that's going on here. It's not just myself and Dr. Bedell and cabinet that's talking about it and giving. We need to make sure that it's truly a community and internal effort. Then the last thing is just to make you smile. It's of course our students at the Education Foundation Breakfast. Are there any questions? Thank you, Ms. Collier White. Questions from the board? Okay. Yeah, so um, I, I always do this and I'm gonna keep keep doing it, right? Like I appreciate it. You you mentioned you're a team of one, and yes, you've got a supporting staff around you, right? And Dr. Bedell and team, but to do what you've done not entirely by yourself, but really leading the way and doing the hard work day in and day out is pretty amazing, right? And so thank you for pouring yourself into this effort. I mean, a $2 million impact over you know five years is incredible. Um, I'm telling you that event last week or a couple of weeks ago, none of us know when see, this event see, was. See. Um, that's just how amazing it was. <laughs> uh, yeah. uh, I mean, that event was incredible. Thank you. Right. I mean, you, you, God blessed you a little bit with the weather. Oh man. Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, but, but above and beyond that, I mean, it was well orchestrated. It was communicated. Well, it was, I mean, the, I'm going to get geek out a little bit, but the design inside of it was awesome. The Paseo choir was great. Dr. Bedell was okay on stage <laughs> and, um, <laughs> but no, it was, it was really phenomenal. And so thank you for continuing to do the work that you're doing. Um, I would also like to recognize, I noticed on, on your board of directors um, sheet that uh, Mr. Coughlin is no longer on the board. He is being moved to an ex-officio okay. status. So well, it's it's not reflected on there, yeah, but he I, is still 
a true member of our board. Look, talk about a strong supporter of Absolutely. Kansas City Public Schools. Absolutely. I think we owe Bill a, a round of applause Absolutely. for the incredible work that you've done. Um, and then I guess the final thing I would say is I nudged one of your board members who will remain unnamed uh, to get you some help. Yeah. Because I think you can have even greater, uh, you know, an even greater impact. Uh, yeah. And I know it'll cost a little bit on the front end, but it'll pay off on the back end really, really quickly. So I yeah. hope you're able to sort of move in that direction. I don't see it on your goals for the upcoming year, but man, if there's a way to get you some, some support, whether they're going out in the community and helping with fundraising or doing a lot of the administrative tasks that so you can right. do more of the being in the community, I think it would be helpful and, and allow you to, to sort of greaten your impact even more. So that's all I got. I appreciate that. And, and I think that's a part of that five-year strategic plan. We have to make sure at some point that we're not only reimbursing KCPS for my benefits, but for my salary. Sure. And I don't want to be a burden on the district. We're supposed to enhance. And so we need to make sure that's built into our operations. So as we go into our, our planning process, that is a part of the discussion is how do we help cover my salary, but then also bring in some additional support or cover my salary so then KCPS can fund another possession, some, something of that nature, but there has to be a balance. So that's definitely in the conversation. That sounds like Linda has been weighing on you or Miss Quinley. <laughs> no, <laughs> actually, sorry. I do have one other thing that I just want to make sure people know. So yes. um, you, you have me listed and look, I, I mean, I was engaged, pretty engaged initially um, and have backed away is, you know, been a good co contributor. I've had to back away from that as well because we started, you know, our family foundation or um, scholarship, but I want to thank Miss Cortez for being yes. consistent and engaged as well. So thank you for Absolutely. your contribution to the Ed Foundation. So yes. that's all I got. Last thing I'll say is you can give, you can donate anything you want, any amount. It's, it's no, no amount is too small. Uh, so yes, you can go on kcpsfoundation.org and give, you can donate. Uh, I do believe a good chunk of our cabinet is our, they donate through payroll deduction, our new people that we have, our interims. I know they want to sign up too. So see me later. I won't call out names, but, um, yeah, it's, it's a good effort. We hope we can, you know, do proper due diligence and keep talking about the good things going on in KCPS. So just thank you for giving me the time to come here today and tell you a little bit about what we do. And then of course, supporting um, my position in the district. So thank you all. Thanks. Good job, appreciate the update. All right, so I think we are ready now to move into, and before we go into the workshop presentation, let me go ahead and just cover this real quick. Um, I do want to acknowledge Hispanic Heritage Month. Um, we had our lunch and learn yesterday. It was absolutely phenomenal. As you can see, the board auditorium is decorated with um, many of the artifacts, our competition that we had with our say, say puede. You know, I, you know I, I will murder some, I'm sorry. I just don't practice it. You lose a C, say puede, got it. And then also Maddie Rhodes, I believe, came over and kind of helped us uh, decorate the uh, building. But I do want to thank Leo. He was our uh, presenter, the executive director over the YMCA. He was our keynote speaker. And there were a number of other individuals that came in yesterday and just kind of fed into the faculty and staff here and then those who logged on online. So just wanted to make sure I covered that before we get into our workshop piece. So at this time, I want to have uh, David Rand. He's going to get us started with the 1.1 student academic performance. Uh, Dr. Collier will come in and then we will also have Dr. Phil Jones who will provide uh, portions of this presentation. All right, thank you, Dr. Bedell. Uh, good evening, Board Chair Hogan, Dr. Bedell, board, community. Uh, thank, really appreciate having the time this evening to share some information with you uh, regarding our policy 1.1, uh, which is student academic performance. So to start with in talking about relevant policy, obviously the title slide 1.1 for board policy, uh, that is the student academic performance, uh, also aligns with our administrative policy IL, which references our assessment program, as that is how we measure our student performance. In terms of our strategic plan, it aligns with goal three, which is talking about continuous growth towards mastery for all students as well as pillar A, which references rigorous learning for every individual student uh, in terms of culturally responsive teaching and learning. Lastly, uh, it hits our superintendent 
quality indicator 2.2 as part of his evaluation that talks about effective instructional programs, specifically around the core content area. In terms of our key performance indicators or our KPIs, we have three major KPIs that we look at. The state assessment, obviously incredibly important, is one of them. Another one is our locally administered assessment, iReady, which is a diagnostic online assessment uh, that we purchase from curriculum associates and administer. And then lastly is our annual performance report that's part of the Missouri School Improvement Program. And so obviously that is what really drives our points in terms of whether or not we're able to attain accreditation. When we look at our state assessment results, we look at them a couple different ways. Obviously, the most popular and well known is just looking at proficiency rates. Uh, we like to look at the percentage of kids that are in each performance level. Also, there is what is called a MAP performance index that takes into account the percentage of students at each performance level. Uh, the key to MAP performance index is that allows us to see credit or get credit for moving students out of below basic into basic which you don't necessarily see reflected if you're just looking at proficient and advanced. In our iReady data, we look at the percentage of students at each tier, that's tier one, two, and three. Basically tier one is our students that are near or on grade level. Our tier two are those students that are one to two years below grade level. And then the tier three are gonna be those students that are two or more years below grade level. In terms of our uh, also iReady, Another important metric that we look at is our student growth. And so in the fall, when students take the test, based on whatever they score, they are given two growth goals. One is the expected growth. That's basically if you took every single student that scored at the 50th percentile and looked at all of them and whether they ended up as spring, if you take the average of that, that would be the expected growth. So basically, whoever is all on your same level what is the average of those students? And then there's a stretch goal metric, which provides a higher goal, which really is important for our students that are below grade level, because if you're below grade level and just meet your expected growth, you're never gonna get caught up to grade level. You may move up a little, uh, but that's not going to, to get it done. And so it's really important that we look at those. Lastly, for our annual performance report or our APR, the student achievement, the academic achievement and subgroup achievement, that all comes from our state assessment and that makes up a little ha over half of what the APR looks at. And then a good chunk of our college and career readiness indicator from the APR is for our uh, college ready or college admissions type assessments like ACT, ASVAB, Acu Acuplacer, and so forth. Looking at some history and previous context, our iReady assessment, this is our fourth year of using it. We switched uh, our NWEA measures of academic performance in school year 1819 to iReady. We give this assessment at grades K through eight. Uh, it kind of maxes out at eighth grade. Uh, we make the fall assessment optional for kindergartners. And it also is available for our high schools that wanna use it with at-risk ninth grade students. The great thing about iReady is the very good correlation, high correlation coefficient with the state assessment. And so when we looked at spring 2019 iReady versus actual spring 2019 MAP data, the predicted iReady MAP performance index came basically within one point in both English language arts and math. And so that's showing a really, really tight correlation. In looking at our state assessment, there's been a lot of changes over the years. And with the past two years, also some gaps. So that presents some challenges. Obviously in spring 2020, we did not administer the state assessment as nobody was in school. We did give the state assessment last spring, but those results are not gonna be part of accountability well, they say that, but they're gonna publish the scores, which inherently implies some accountability, but there won't be an official annual performance report that assigns points based on the assessment. And if you look at the history of the assessment, as Dr. Bedell has shared before, it's, it's, it's switched a lot. And so we haven't had a situation where we have five or six years of continuous data that's comparing apples to apples. 
at the grade level assessments for English language arts and math, those were new in 1718. In terms of our science grade level assessment, that was new in 1819. And then we also have our end of course exams or our EOC exams. So the grade level assessments are for grades three through eight. The end of course exams are specific to actual courses to where once a student successfully completes that course, they're expected to then take that exam. There are a set of EOC exams that are required for graduation. So all of our KCPS students need to complete these four EOC exams in order to graduate. That's the Algebra 1, the Biology, the English 2 or English 10, as well as the Government. Uh, one thing to keep in mind for our eighth grade students that take Algebra 1 and complete that end of course exam, that does not apply to their graduation requirement. Those students still have to take the Algebra 2 assessment at some point in high school. The optional assessments are listed there. In 18 and 19, the district administered the Algebra 2 as well as the English 1 or the English 9, but those are the only ones of the optional assessments that, that were administered in those years. So that lack of newer data means that our most recent state assessment results that are official and count for accountability are from 1819. You'll see those two years up here. The reason we didn't include 17 again was that change in the assessment in 1718, which would make uh, comparisons to previous years kind of an apples and oranges comparison. And so I just kind of wanted to remind us as far as our previous history between 18 and 19, the district did show some gains while the state actually showed some regression or stayed flat. And so that's how we were able to close some of that gap. And I know Dr. Bedell has spoken with you a lot about how in our individual subgroups, we've actually been able to close that gap a lot more than we have overall as a district. You'll also see our last three years of annual performance report with the amount of points possible and the amount of points that we earned. Again, 1819 is the most recent APR, and I think we actually had to request the points for that. We were one of maybe two or three districts in the entire state that said, yes, we want to be transparent and see where we ended up. If, as been shared with the board as we've been working towards accreditation, if you average the three years, we're over 70%. If you remove attendance from 19, we'd be over 70%. Uh, but unfortunately, that 18 and 19 with not being able to get above 70% in 19 uh, is, is why we're not fully accredited. In terms of our current status, we have given our iReady test in fall that's completed pretty soon after school starts. We give a couple weeks for kids to get acclimated and then want to get that baseline data. We just finished giving our district interim results. Uh, that we've shared some information on that with the board before. Actually, the testing window the last day was today. And so we'll be getting those results. We'll be looking at some of that at our retreat on Friday, and schools are really digging into that information. We have received our initial state assessment results, uh, but those are currently embargoed until the state officially releases them. Currently, in their official publication, it's showing a TBD or to be determined date. I heard yesterday that that date is most likely going to coincide with the release of the state report cards, and that's not going to come until December 1st. As I mentioned, there is not going to be an annual performance report based off this last school year. And the state is currently transitioning, working on transitioning to an updated MSIP or Missouri School Improvement Program going from five to six. The work on six has actually been going on since 2017. Uh, so it's, it's, it's been going on for, for quite a while. And ultimately, MSIP six will replace MSIP five, but that's still a couple years uh, down the line. The next assessment that we're looking at giving will be that winter iReady. Uh, we really tried to set up the assessment calendar that created some good gaps in terms of district assessments so that schools can concentrate on classroom instruction and their own short cycle formative assessments. 
In terms of our data, this is our iReady results presented by tier. Again, tier one are those students that are near or on grade level. Tier two, those students that are one to two. And our tier three students are those students that are two or more years below grade level. We are seeing the last three fall administrations. So that's fall 19, fall 20, and fall 21. And as you can see in reading, we saw some increases in terms of students at tier one and decreases of students in tier three. Uh, we feel fairly confident that is a function of students testing at home, especially with our younger students probably getting some help from family members, because you see that this fall, we've kind of gone back to what those uh, scores were looking like pre-COVID. In math, you see a similar trend where we saw an increase from fall 19 to fall 20, but we have actually fallen back down to where we're a little bit behind where we were pre-COVID in terms of math. With that, I would like to turn it over to Dr. Collier, who is gonna share, are we going? Yeah. Oh, the slide's on there, but the picture isn't. Yeah. You only have it on there. Oh. No, it looks like it. Yeah, it isn't there. Um, thank you. So with, with all of that information um, that was just shared, um, I think it's important for us to look at um, what we are doing instructionally. And so what I wanted to share tonight was the instructional framework and our theory of action. Um, for those of you who have been here on the board, this is not new. This is something that we have already been focusing on previously. One of the things that we said that we're going to, to do this year with all of the changes and the disruption in education that we've experienced over the last year is that this year we're really wanting to stay the course, but to go a little bit deeper um, in some of the initiatives and things that we've already been focused on. But our, for our instructional framework work, we utilize um, Richard Elmore's instructional core. And just to make it simple, especially since everybody can't see it, it really consists of three critical components. And those components are really the, the, the teacher, the student, and the content. That's really what it's about, those things that are happening in the classroom. And Richard Elmore says that there are really only three ways um, to improve student learning at scale across the building, not just one or two classrooms. And that first thing is increasing teacher instructional skill and knowledge, which is really all about building teacher capacity. So that's, we know that's one of the things that we have to focus on as a school system, building that capacity through professional learning opportunities. The next is increasing the level of complexity of the content, and that's around the standards, the content that students are going to learn, ensuring that that content is rigorous, that we're aligning the, um, the teaching to the standards. And then that third is shifting the role of the student in the instructional process. So the, the student has to do the cognitive lift. They have to be fully engaged, but also we have to look at what tasks are we assigning to our students that indicate to us that they are proficient in a, in a particular standard or skill. And this is where we tie in our um, proficiency skills. Our teachers are able to look at the proficiency scales and know exactly where our students are performing. Are they at a proficient level? If they can complete a particular task, then they're at that proficiency level. If they're at a level two, then we know that there's still more growth that needs to happen. Or if they're at level one, or perhaps they have exceeded proficiency and they're, and they're able to complete tasks at level four. Our teachers are able now, because of the proficiency skills, to look at exactly where our students are performing and using that information to help guide their instruction and then interventions that need to come into place. But this is our um, instructional core. Um, something else I wanna mention in this core, you'll notice that we have the principal in there. Even though Richard Elmore focuses on three pieces, we did add the, the principal to our, um, our model. And that is because we know that the principal makes the difference in the building. They are able to impact an entire building. And for years, ah, we got it. For years, we, we have known that teachers primarily have the greatest impact in, in, in a classroom. And that is still true. But principals have the greatest potential for impact for an entire school. They set culture and climate in the building. 
They set instructional expectations in the building. They determine where resources are distributed based on needs. So principals play a major role in this process. And we have to make sure that principals are poured into and they receive the professional learning so then they can help monitor and help coach teachers in areas. So whatever training our, our teachers receive, our principals are receiving that even prior to the teachers. So that's the instructional core in, in a quick summary. But then we also have our theory of action, which aligns to um, our instructional framework. And is if the leadership in academics, in academics develop principles using research-based coherent and personalized practices, principal leadership and support will build capable, empowered leaders. As a result, principals will build teachers who deliver personalized, rigorous, culturally responsive learning that will improve student outcomes. So if we pour into our principals, equip them with the skills that they need, the professional learning that they, that they need, then they're able then to su support our teachers. So once again, this is our instructional focus for the year. We're staying the course. And these are the things that we have focused on last year. But once, once again, we're gonna be going deeper into these areas. The first is the proficiency skills. We rolled this out in the spring. And so um, over the summer and the beginning of the, of the school year in the fall, we provided professional development around proficiency skills. What do these look like? Um, how should they be implemented in the classroom? How can you use them to determine um, students' level of proficiency for that particular standard or skill? We have also um, are going deeper into interim assessments. We introduced the, the interim assessments last year. And once again, the, the interim assessments are also close, closely correlated and tied to aligned to the map. So they give us an indication of how our students will perform there. And then also looking at data deep dives. How do we look at this data? What do we do with the data once we have it? Um, how do we use it then to, to drive our instruction? How do we use it then to determine what intervention in particular students may need at a given time? We're going deeper into that conversation. Also internalization of that instructional design. That's a part of that process as well, making sure that our teachers not just know it, but they really begin to think and internalize what are the best strategies or ways to, to teach this particular content? What are some things that I can do differently? If I need to reteach, what should be done differently so that students learn it or understand it the second time? And then um, Wednesday PLC meetings. We know how important it is for our teachers to have that time of collaboration, to come together for collegial conversations, for constructive debate, looking at student data, having conversations about how we teach standards. Those are things that are happening in our Wednesday PLC meetings. And so once again, we're going deeper in these areas this school year. At this time, Dr. Jones is going to talk a little more specifically around what our curriculum instruction team has designed in these four areas. So I'm going to turn it over to him. We're going to start with the proficiency scales. Good evening. So as Dr. Collier alluded to, uh, there are certain uh, practices that we found to be very successful in previous years. And those are the practices that we definitely want to keep and make more robust. But there are some areas that we had to change and shift so that we could better uh, support our teachers, our principals, and our students. So with the proficiency scales, this was an initiative that was actually started uh, last year. And we're finding that now we're getting more traction with the teachers, with the principals. And again, just like it says, this is a visual representation of how learning should occur as we matriculate or go from those easy to grasp tasks to those that uh, have a larger cognitive load. In addition to the proficiency scales, the other area that we started last year were our data deep dives. And with these, we're not just looking at what the correct answer is for a particular assessment, but then why did the students select that and how we could change instruction to match the needs of the students. Uh, primarily looking at assessments in three areas, one being the interim assessments, the other being the uh, iReady assessments, and then also looking at the pre-ACT data that we get from our ninth and 10th grade students. Now, when we talk about this internalization, it goes to the idea that once you learn something, you have to put it into practice and you have to do it repeatedly over time. 
So with the internalization, that's what it really is, how to put this into practice. Now, one of the things that we realized, in addition to the principles being a educational or instructional support in the building, you also have instructional coaches. So one of the things that uh, curriculum instruction is doing is making sure that we have targeted learning opportunities for those uh, instructional coaches throughout the entire year in addition to still providing the support to our teachers in the after-school PDs, with all of this really being around internalization uh, across the content areas. With PLCs, this is again, another area where, you know, we have done this in the past, but we wanna be definitely intentional about how it happens. So if you notice, this is an example of a building PLC calendar for the entire year. So besides the topics, I definitely want to draw your attention to those areas where you see CNI PLC, because at this point, this is where the curriculum coordinators come into a building and really help support uh, those uh, building leaders and the teachers internalize not only the proficiency skills, but also the information that they're getting from their data deep dives. Now, with this year, one of the areas that we definitely want to see growth in is mathematics. And, you know, one of the things that we wanted to do was increase the number of math interventionists. But just like with bus drivers and just like with math teachers, you know, it's very hard to find individuals to fill these positions. So there are two things that we're looking at. So from the human capital side, we're looking at, okay, what are some things that we could leverage to help students now? So we're looking at being able to hire math tutors, but also use a program that was very successful for us this summer, which was the student internship program, and allow students to get community credit hours by serving as math tutors uh, in, in some of the buildings. In addition to that, we definitely have to have resources that support that tier two and that tier three instruction and have those embedded into our curriculum maps. So if you notice, that's why we have the iReady teacher toolbox, which is embedded, as well as the Alex program that also is a resource embedded in our nine, 12 years. The last two really get to the engagement piece. So again, we have teachers who are not only just new to our district, but new to the teaching profession. So these learning progressions really help those teachers scaffold out and understand how this is supposed to look week to week uh, to really help them onboard a lot of this information and get up to speed. The last one is the engagement for students. We don't want math to just live in its own silo. We want them to understand students, to understand that math is a part of their everyday life. So with all of their units, there is this performance task that links what they're doing on paper to what they're gonna experience in real life. So this is where we get to the real world applications. So at this point, I'm gonna turn the presentation back over to Dr. Collier. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jones. So now let's take a look at um, some of our future planning. Um, one of those pieces obviously is around acceleration of learning. Um, we all know, understand and know some of the effects of COVID-19 in terms of um, what some may term as learning loss or maybe perhaps learning stagnation. And so one of the things we're focusing this year is on that acceleration of learning. And through the um, distribution of ESSER funds, we are able then to provide some very specific supports for our schools. Um, once again, as we've talked about the use of ESSER funds, we'll continue to um, evaluate how best to use those funds. So it, 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 this is very fluid, how we determine what, we, what our needs are as our students continue to take their assessments and we, under, and we have a better understanding of how they're progressing even this year, that will help to inform how we utilize funds for ESSER 3 going into next school year. Also alignment with MSIP 6, um, although we're not currently in, in that stage, we do know what some of the criteria is around that. So we're wanting to, wanting to make sure that we begin aligning ourselves with that criteria. And then intentional goal setting. And this is uh, not only at the district level, but even at the school level through the school improvement plans. But we're looking at our MAP and our EOC data. We're really focused on moving our the students that are currently in that below basic category from below basic into basic. And then of course, we still want to move students from basic to proficient and proficient to advanced. Um, and then the I ready, making sure that our students are meeting those goals that are set for them. So, so there are some expectations around growth. And so we're wanting to be sure as we look at the winter data, which we'll do later, um, we'll have an idea how our students are progressing toward those goals. Um, and then also 
in iReady, uh, one of the great things, and I think Mr. Wren already mentioned it, is that um, they, they do provide a projected proficiency report that gives us an indication of how our students will then actually perform on the map. And so that is helpful to us as well. And all of this information and data is made available to our teachers. They're able to go into iReady and they can see all of this information for themselves. No one has to go and run a report to give to them. This is information that they are able to access. And then also our Blueprint 2030 Student Achievement Goals and Planning. As we look out into Blueprint 2030, continuing to plan around what our instructional focus will be and where we want to see our students um, in terms of academics and social emotional growth. And then here are some of our successes. Um, as we consider our, our data from the last school year, um, we know once again, there was a lot of learning loss and especially when we look across the nation and the state. But one thing that we can celebrate is for Kansas City Public Schools, we did not experience um, a, a significant decline for ELA and reading for our students. Um, when you saw the data earlier around um, the iReady data for reading, you noticed that it was pretty stagnant what, where we were prior to COVID-19 and where we are now. So we didn't see a lot of growth, but we didn't see a great decline. And so we are fortunate for that. We're continuing to focus on reading. We're not going to let, let up on that, but we're also focusing a little bit deeper this year on math to address some of our needs and concerns around that area. We're continuing the professional learning communities, interim assessments, our deep data dives that I talked about earlier. Um, and so we're excited about that, that we have an opportunity once again to go a little deeper and to be really sure that our teachers have a firm understanding of these components here. The next piece is the customization and implementation of the proficiency skills. I think this piece here is huge because we did not just go purchase a, a, a proficiency scale package and say, well, here's, um, here are our proficiency skills. Our curriculum and instruction, in, in, curriculum and, and instruction team, I'm sorry, they worked diligently to ensure that those proficiency skills were aligned with our standards in our curriculum. So when our teachers are looking at these proficiency skills, they have a, um, a very clear idea of what tasks they should be doing in order to ensure that our students are meeting proficiency according to our curriculum, according to the standards for the state of Missouri. And I think that that's huge. And, and we expect some good gains from that. Also, because math is a focus for us, our curriculum and instruction team work to embed some of those resources that um, Dr. Jones talked about that were in the iReady uh, toolkit, that teacher toolkit, it really does a lot of great work for the teacher in terms of um, indicating to them which standards and skills students are performing well in and ones that they aren't, um, what types of lessons can be provided and resources to help students that need that additional help. All of those resources and tools are provided in iReady. And when I sat down with the iReady leaders and they walked me through that toolkit, it, it was amazing. I really couldn't believe all that was there in terms of resources for our staff. But what our um, curriculum and instruction folks did is they made sure that they embedded those in the curriculum so that our teachers don't have to go searching and looking for that. It's right there when they click on the curriculum map, those resources are right there and readily available for them. We want to make this a more seamless process for our teachers. And we're gonna be doing that in other areas as well, but we're focusing primarily on math this year and making sure our teachers have the support they need. Um, reading interventionists, we added reading interventionists this year. We heard loud and clear from our teachers at the Blueprint 2030 meetings that they wanted more reading interventionists, and then also instructional coach PLCs. We've had instructional coaches, but we have not had a time for them to come together, to learn together, and then also be sure that we had clear expectations around their role and their responsibilities. Once again, we don't want to throw resources out to the building and not really be um, certain that everyone understands what expectations are. So we are having time for the instructional coaches. Barriers, we talked about already the turnaround time in state reporting. We know that that is an issue, um, even the fact that we can't really even um, share data until um, later in December. And so that's, that's an issue. When, when you get that data, you really want to get it in time so that you can plan for that next school year. So we're hoping that that's something that will change. Lack of consistent state assessment that Mr. Rand talked about, those changes make it very difficult for us to do comparisons year to year. Uh, COVID-19, the quarantines, the lack of in-person instruction, that has been a barrier for us specifically for this year. Um, that we, and we've talked a lot about that before. And then just overall human capital is we're just not seeing the number of applicants that we would see, have seen in years past. And then that creates teacher vacancies when teachers are leaving. Um, it's just very difficult to then go back and fill those positions. So those have been some of our barriers uh, and concerns um, that we have been um, looking at this year. 
And then finally, our action items. Once again, December 8th, um, we're expecting that we'll be able to share out um, the, the state assessment data at that time. Um, and then also Desi releases the KCPS report card and Mr. Wren will be sharing that data when it comes in. And then February 9th is when we have our next policy monitoring 1.1 and we'll be able to share out our winter iReady results. So today you saw where our students were this fall kind of as a baseline uh, data. In December, you'll we'll be, able, be able to talk about what kind of growth we've seen in those areas um, presented on the iReady. Then also interim one and two results and deep data dive results we'll be able to share out and I and um, Mr. Rand will be sharing that information. Thank you. All right, thank you, Dr. Collier, Mr. Rand and Dr. Sorry. Phil. I just like to call Dr. Phil. What questions does the board have? I'm going to I'm going to wait cuz I'm sure Ms. Buckner has some questions, but I'm going to give her a minute here and see if we have any questions across looking at for Ms. Ford online. Okay, Ms. Buckner. Thank you, Mr. Hogan. Um so no surprise here. Uh my I think I'm really just interested in understanding how the district defines uh, culturally responsive teaching and how that shows up in that Elmore model. Okay, um, culturally responsive teaching, um, the, way we would, we, we, the way we would define it is that it's instruction that honors, embraces, and reflects our students' cultures, whatever that might be, the variety of cultures that are represented, whether that's ethnicity, whether that's sexual orientation, gender, whatever that difference might be, we wanna make sure that all of that is reflected in our curriculum and also in um, the types of learning activities that teachers are doing in the classroom with students. Okay, so um, I think that is a, something that's up for debate. Um, and so um, uh, when we talk about culturally responsive teaching, what was presented today is awesome. I really love the idea of, um, of un unpacking like where students are and next steps for teachers. But I'm, I'm looking at this Elmore model and it talks a lot about skill, uh, building teacher capacity, mm -hmm. right? And you mentioned culturally responsive teaching and mm -hmm. I will argue that culturally responsive teaching is much more than that, right? And so um, I wonder, I, I guess where I'm going with this is like, in what ways are we ensuring that our teachers are um, not only just being responsive to the data, right? but also being responsive to the children that are seated, sitting in these seats. And so I know you said um, that their culture is reflected, but in what way is the teaching like showing up and being different or being responsive in that way? Yeah, oh, so I was trying to give a definition on the fly. Yes, it's, there is a lot more involved in um, culturally responsive teaching. Um, but I think a part of it is our teachers really knowing and understanding our students, understanding their backgrounds, where they're coming from, what their, their needs are, even understanding their different types of learning needs, understanding that children learn in different ways, they come with different strengths, and, and teachers taking the time to um, unpackage that for each child and really know and understand the, the needs of that child. And so a part of, when you ask about the uh, instructional core, a part of that is that professional learning. That's implicit in that process. There has to be time for professional learning for our leaders, number one, because they have to then uh, carry out and influence what's happening in the building with their teachers and in the classroom. And they have to really champion that idea in their conversations and in their work and in their leadership and model that then for our teachers so that our teachers understand how they should be engaging with our students. And But a lot of it is through professional learning, starting with our leaders first, and then also making sure that our teachers are getting the professional learning that they need around that. Yeah, um, thank you for that. I really, I, if, in total transparency, I am really um, concerned about, um, this isn't just a, a KCPS district thing. I'm thinking about how uh, education, the landscape is changing. Our mm -hmm. children are different. Mm -hmm. uh, these are pandemic babies. They have experienced a lot. And so we have to really take a critical look at like how our students learn, right? Um, and how their brains, like mm -hmm. we have to really just be in tune with their, their cognitive um, 
awareness um, and uh, I, I'm just really concerned about that. And so I just wonder what KCPS approach is um, mm -hmm. to our, our changing landscape. Ooh, I, I, let me get in on this okay. one. So um, I know you did a retreat with your team. Yes. And I think as we are taking a look at what the particular goals are going to be and how we write those goals and what does the next iteration of our strategic plan look like, I think you're going to see a lot more of that really from a cultural responsive standpoint play out within our strategic plan. We've done, we've done implicit bias training. We've done equity audits. We do a lot of these things, but I think to your point around the intentionality of, of how it plays out throughout our curriculum um, within our strategic plan. And then how do we make sure that all of that aligns really to our equity policy, right? When we talk about what we want, where do we want this system to be? How do we make sure that we are able to make sure that lived experiences are something that everybody gets to have an opportunity to understand and learn about in our respective classes? So to your point, when we talk about Blueprint 2030 and we talk about this opportunity, right, to go from being a very rigid operating organization to one that is caught up with the times that our kids walk out in, into the world that they walk out into. These are the conversations that we're having around how we can shape the future of this school district to really meet that, that those needs in terms of what you're asking about. Mm -hmm. And I think where you're going <clears throat> is, you know, and I hear you on this, if the practice doesn't change inside of the classrooms, mm -hmm. but you do all of this other stuff, then where will we be in seven years, right? Are we doing this again because we haven't caught up to what the richness of what we really mm -hmm. have to offer and how, that's, how that plays out in our curriculum and in our strategic plan? So I know that was a, mm -hmm. I know that was a part of the focus that you guys are yes. working on as you're looking at these goals. Right. Well, I, I don't know if that answers and your question. Can I just yeah, add, yeah. I, I appreciate you bringing that up, Dr. Bedell, because I think a lot also... Um, is impacted by how we're structured, even here in central office. Um, for example, um, the, my division now is not just academics. And I know that's something we haven't shared out with everybody. It's not just academics. In my division, HR is there, also student support. And so one of the things Dr. Woodley really focuses in on, um, and she has consistently since she's been here, is exactly what you're talking about, that cultural relevancy and that social emotional support for students and really um, helping people understand what that actually looks like. Because we see new teachers that come in every year and she does that training with them and you hear the question from them, they're not even really sure of what that means. And so that's some of the work that we're doing. What we're doing in our division, we're trying to remove the silos and really bring us together and help. And one of the activities that we did on Friday was looking at the interconnectedness of all of our work. Instead of seeing HR as this separate piece and this is what I do, student support, social emotional work, this is what I do, academics, this is what you do over here. We have to start seeing how all of this intersects and how it makes sense together. And that's, that's a part of the work that we're trying to do in our division. And I think that, that through this work, as we plan, we were excited about the progress we made on Friday, but the more that we do this, I think you're gonna see more of that showing up um, in our conversations, in the work that we're doing, in our teachers' conversations, in the practices in the classroom. That's, that's a part of what we're looking at. And even when we looked at the goals for Blueprint 2030, we did a, a, almost a total rehaul of what was there as we took time that afternoon to go to go through all of that, um, through looking at things through that very lens that you're talking about. Thank you for unpacking that. Um, I, I think you all are doing amazing work and I'm happy, I'm super excited to hear that we're moving in that direction. And um, just a shameless plug, Zaretta Hammond's culturally responsive teaching. Oh yeah. Yes, and the yeah. brain, so yeah. yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so, uh, as Ms. Buckner was asking her questions, the one thing I could, you know, I started thinking about is this whole reflecting of our kids' culture in the actual curriculum itself. And so I wonder mm -hmm. if having a single Black history class and a single Hispanic history class is enough, and should it go all the way down to, you know, elementary school? Answer is yes, it needs to go 
it needs to be reflected all through the curriculum. That's something else we're looking and talking about as we move forward. It's, it's a lot of pieces, but yes, you're right on, spot on. Yeah, one course is not enough. Okay. Um, I think we're good, thank you. Okay, thank you. All right, we'll move to our second presentation. And this is uh, 1.2 College and Career Readiness. And um, this is presented by our um, Career College Readiness Task Force. Daryl Davis is going to get us started. And I do want to just make sure I, I make mention of this. I know it wasn't too long ago that some of this data was presented to the board in the community. I think we, we made some, some updates based on what has trickled in, but um, some of this may look familiar, but this is the most recent data we have that adheres to this workshop presentation. All right. Thank you and good evening, Superintendent Bedell, Board Chair Hogan, members of the board and audience. This evening, the College and Career Readiness Task Force will provide an update on Board Policy 1.2. You will see through tonight's presentation that we have looked at what has been done in the past through a data-driven lens. We'll also look at our current status through a data-driven lens, and you'll also see what we're proposing as we move forward using the data at hand to inform our recommendations. So members of the task force are uh, with me here in the back. There's eight of us here this evening. Several uh, will come forward with presentations, but all stand ready at the end of our presentation to answer any questions. Uh, you see on the slide here as we look at our relevant uh, topic and the alignment with uh, the work that the CCR task force leads, uh, clearly it's aligned to policy 1.2, that all scholars will graduate from our system, empowered to choose their path to a successful future. It's also embedded into our mission statement that the purpose of Kansas City Public Schools is to provide a quality education and to ensure that students are prepared for success in college, career, and life. And lastly, it's also embedded into our strategic plan in goal five, that all students will uh, leave our system with a six-year plan on file. So next, I will bring to the microphone, Ms. Crystal Everett, who is our manager of career and tech ed. All right, good evening, everyone. Um, as Dr. Davis mentioned, Crystal Everett here, um, manager of CTE, KCPS alum and KCPS parent, of an aspiring astronaut and ballerina. So just wanna put that out there when my daughter's doing these fancy things on the moon. So um, our CCR task force, we are able to meet monthly and this is really just an opportunity for all these different departments to come together to make sure that we're focusing on both college and career readiness. I can say from my experience as a student at Lincoln, it was where are you going to college, not an if. But what I love to see from this professional lens is that we're able to ask students kind of the what's your plan after high school that it can include both college and career. And so what you can see from that graphic, you've seen it before probably over the last year and a half or so, it really just shows how we're able to execute this college and career readiness plan um, and how our task force is working. So you see uh, really those foundational pieces that we're able to do with students, obviously even before that middle school level, but ultimately leading to those market value assets, the college credit, the internships that you heard about, from summer school, but also that you're here, you will hear about tonight as well. And so speaking of market value assets, of course, we are part of the Real World Learning Initiative. And so, so far, we've received over $400,000 from the Kauffman Foundation to really push that work forward. A part of it is just figuring out where are we when we say we want all students in this Kansas City region to graduate with at least one market value asset. Um, and so a lot of that money is able to support figuring out where we were and then how we wanna grow. Because again, by 2030, all students in this Kansas City region, um, that is the goal to make sure they have those. Of course, we also have uh, some college work that we're pushing forward with our college access uh, corner. And we have uh, Ms. Joyce Wynn Hernandez, who was drafted over from Lincoln to support in that college access role. You've heard about AVID already tonight. Kids to College is actually one of my favorite events that I've been able to help with on the MCC side and the KCPS side where we have all of our sixth graders over on the Penn Valley campus really just seeing what is this about and being able to step foot on that campus knowing what those possibilities are in the future. Um, another thing that we're doing to really push forward this work 
is utilizing the connector. So working with Prep KC to bring industry into the classroom. Of course, there's those things that we just simply can't take our students to. We got some future astronauts, for example. We can't really take them to the moon, but uh, we can be able to show them uh, what NASA is like and how different people work in this capacity. But it also helps eliminate some of those transportation barriers, field trips, permission slips, you all know how that goes. Um, and so just being able to have those industry connections with the classroom, obviously great use during the pandemic when we still wanted to be able to have that exposure for students. Um, so of course the data, how do we, where have we been? How do we grow from here? And so our current status you can see here uh, from your information is just really seeing uh, where our students are going. So we have our 180 day follow-up, just figuring out where our graduates are six months after graduation. So this, uh, the last data compiled is from SY20. We know what happened in school year 20. Um, and so a lot of students we found anecdotally were deferring college because they weren't necessarily interested in pursuing the college education virtually, had done that for a few months um, and maybe deferred um, until a later date. And then you also just see uh, Paseo, we know that Paseo has uh, traditionally had a pretty small graduating class, so you can see some of that decline there. Um, but the other side of that data is not only just figuring out where students are uh, when they graduate, if they're going to a two or four year college, but also being able to see what other positive placements. So when we are talking about college and career readiness, we're saying that success doesn't just come because you went to college uh, right after you graduated from high school. So you can see some of those increases from our students uh, who graduated in 2020 from Northeast as well as Southeast. So being able to access the workforce um, and being able to uh, access the military or other uh, placements once they, once they graduated. So for example, again, when we talk about the different programs that we have at Manual specifically, some of our students are ready to make more than a first year teacher right, at, right out of high school. And so why wouldn't we want them to be able to access some of those opportunities. So I know you all probably have questions and I know we have them at the end, but I will pass it over to Mr. Jerome Williams. All right, uh, thank you, Crystal. Good evening. I'm Jerome Williams. I work in the Accountability Research and Assessment Office as Manager of Research and Assessment. So the next couple of slides I'm going to talk about are going to be specifically AP exams, IP exams, and a little bit of information about I, IB, and then ACT. So the table you're looking at right here, um, current status, SY21 qualifying advanced placement scores. This is a list or a table that shows uh, by subgroup the number of kids that had a qualifying AP score in SY21. In order to be qualifying, it needs to be a three or greater. Um, interesting to point out here that in SY19, we had nine students, SY2051, and then in 21, all the way up to 61. So I think that that really shows the intentionality at KCPS of making sure that more students are enrolled in these AP courses and actually sitting for those exams. Um, one opportunity for growth here is if you look, Hispanic female 15 and white female at 13 are making up almost 50% of those scores. So there is an opportunity um, within these other subgroups to make sure that, um, you know, they're not being outpaced by one particular group or two groups. What we're looking at here is current status, international baccalaureate or IB. So the top um, graph on the left of the screen is going to be IB candidates. You can see in SY19, that number of candidates was 32 and 21. It rose to 40, which is an increase of 10% over three years. And then IB diplomas earned. SY1917, SY21 up to 33. So this is actually very encouraging because not only is uh, 33 students earning the diploma out of 40 in SY20, which is about 82%, you can see the tremendous um, significant gain with the amount of students that were even IB candidates and then actually earning that diploma over that same three-year period. And we also see the percent of IB students scoring a four or above on that exam from 64.9% to 74.6%. This table here or chart is only showing the exam score um, a number. So that would be a one through seven, and this is four or above. IB does have three supplemental assessments where the students earn a letter grade. Um, those assessments do not count towards um, the CCR assessment criteria with DESI. 
And right now we've got 44 IB diploma candidates for SY22. Current status ACT, this is a four year look at um, ACT results for graduates, SY17, SY20. Um, again, 21 is not on here. Uh, we do have those results. We are currently appealing some of that data standard uh, procedure in the state of Missouri. Uh, DESE receives ACT scores from the vendor. And then if there's a score that gets missed for whatever reason, we have an opportunity to appeal that score. And then that data would be populated on the uh, SY21 scorecard. So what you see here is that in 17, we had about um, 640 kids take the assessment. Um, and that has risen to 700 in SY20. Um, we also have more graduates um, in SY20 than we did in SY17. And a look at you know, ACT results by domain, you will see uh, ACT composite average of 16.9 uh, and 17 down to 16.4 and 20. You know, some of this is related to the fact that there wasn't a national ACT testing date available after we administered the district choice due to the quarantine. So um, as we're graduating more kids and testing more kids, we will make sure that we make, we're gonna try our best to make sure that every student has an ACT on file before they graduate. And that should actually help those data there. Um, the area of concern, you can see in 17 to, to 20, uh, a drop from 15.9 to 15.2 in English. So, you know, this anecdotally, what I've heard is that, you know, the stamina on the reading and English portion of the ACT is challenging for some of our kids. Um, if you think about it, you know, just reading in general, um, people are able to access quick information. You know, very few people are sitting down and reading full books now. So this probably is a stamina issue. There's also an opportunity through ACT prep to learn test taking strategies, things like take your time, uh, manage your time, read the complete passage, read the complete sentence, don't go to the questions before you do some of these things. So as our students are more exposed to these ACT prep courses and things of that nature, um, we anticipate seeing, seeing an increase in ACT scores. So with that, I would like to pass it over to Dr. Christopher McNeil. Thank you very much. I gotta pull this, this mic down a little bit. All the tall people came before me. <laughs> so um, again, I'm uh, Chris McNeil. Absolute pleasure to, uh, to have a conversation with you and tell you about the great stuff that we got going on. I'm the director of Career and Technical Education. So talk through the current status here. And so some things we want to highlight at our early college academy, 75 students are enrolled. Uh, 55 of them are from Lincoln, nine from Paseo. And then the, uh, the, dish, the remaining 11 uh, is... Uh, accounts for the other comprehensive high schools. The next piece I want to highlight here is uh, career and technical education and real world learning. Really excited uh, about this is that uh, our goal is that 45% of our seniors will graduate release one market value asset. The market value asset will include, um, could be one of the following, it could be industry recognized credential, work experience, client connected project, and entrepreneurial experience. I wanna turn your attention to uh, the graphs here at the top of the screen. So if you look at the bottom one, you see that there is the industry recognized credentials earning. So if you look at uh, the 2019, 20 and 21 school year, you'll see that there is, there's a slight decline there from that 20 to 21 school year. However, that's just a piece of the story. I'm really actually really excited about where we're trending as far as career and technical education. Last year, um, just due to how industry recognized credentials are really made up, a piece of it is really accounts for those, uh, those clock hours and those shop hours. So you have to have a certain amount of hours to be able to really even sit for the exam. And so the fact that we didn't, we didn't lose that many students compared to the previous year in the COVID year really speaks to the dedication of, my, of our teaching staff and the people that we serve. Again, it had to be incredibly resilient and creative in order for that to, get ha in order for that to happen. Across the country, you'll see just that dip of those students being able to earn those IRCs because again, they didn't have access to the facilities and school, et cetera, et cetera. Again, that's just a piece of the story. So if you look at uh, the, uh, the real world learning market value asset opportunities, you see that we're trending up. Again, we're accounting for those other pieces that are not necessarily those industry recognized credentials. Also, um, if you look at this year compared to last year, we saw a significant increase in overall enrollment at Manual Tech. 
And that tells you the story of just how we ended the year and how we set it up for, for the win for this, the beginning of this year. At Manual Tech over the summer, we obviously we did those summer learning opportunities, but also it gave the students at the earlier grades opportunity to really expose to current technical education uh, programming, internships, things of that nature. And that really set the tone and really set us up for the win. I'm happy to say that all of our st their students from every school, including three charter schools, are represented at, um, at uh, Manual Tech including our students from the Missouri Option Program and all those. So our school, Manual Tech, looks like our community. Particularly if you go inside of our, our classroom and our shop areas, you look at those non-traditional students. Those are the students who account for less than 25% of that industry, i.e. You may look at males in, in the nursing field, females in construction. We, our school, Manual Tech and our district looks like that. And so we account for those non-traditional uh, students in, within those industries. So we're really proud and excited about that. I'll move on. All right, CCR. Um, uh, so 20%, uh, a little over 20% of our graduates in 21 like to have a qualifying CCR uh, assessment, which is the ACT, SAT, ASVAB, Accuplace, or Work Keys. So there's some, some work there. Uh, some additional success at ECA, 82% of our students enrolled uh, in, in ECA earned an associate's degree. 70, 74 students received 300 and, uh, three, over 300 hours of college credit. And then uh, finally launched the uh, ACT prep passport. Um, and that included 28 students. Um, the average score increase was 1.8%, 68% improved, showed improvement in overall composite score. And then 57% gained a score, increased the score two to five points, which was really exciting. Future plan is some things we wanna highlight. Uh, the, the increased focus around dual credit uh, will increase those opportunities in all high schools and increase participation of about 25% by 23. Um, CCR task force, each high school graduate will have a CCR assessment by graduation, again, that is the ASVAB, Aggie Place, or ACT, SAT, or Work Keys, which is really, really great. And then finally, for my slide, is that career pathway planning. Uh, and the goal is for us that 100% of our ninth graders will complete a six-year plan. That is incredibly fantastic uh, for us to be able to do. What that does is sets us up for the win. So not only students are, are looking at what are those opportunities or what's their post-graduation plan, but what are things you need to do on, on the, within it in order for you to be successful? So we're really excited about that. And with that, I will turn it over to Ms. Joyce Wynn Hernandez. Hi there, I'm Joyce Wynn Hernandez, the College Access Coordinator. I'm going to go a little bit off script. Um, thank you. Um, you know, about six years ago, I took uh, some students <clears throat> to Paris and to Rome. And um, it was a week long during spring break. And I'm still recovering. 24-7 um, field trip. But in order to prepare our students for that week long trip, we took two years to get them ready. We had to explain what check-in luggage was, carry-on luggage, not to lose certain documents. Otherwise, we'd be at the embassy and spending a lot of money. And so I kind of feel like our CCR vision with a graduate profile is preparing our students at a very early age. We're able to share with them the traits, the characteristics, what they need in their journey to college, uh, to finding success at the college and career levels. For our timeline and action plans, you'll note that uh, the ICAP or the individual career and academic plan that um, Dr. McNeil mentioned, this is going to fuel our programs. It's going to be uh, an empowering tool for our students as they decide what classes they wanna take, as they decide what paths they want to select um, for the next level. Our CTE, our uh, real world learning um, programs will continue uh, to expand as they generate uh, specific benchmarks for our different grade levels to increase those market value assets. And in each high school building, there's a plan to increase ACT test prep so that our students are ready uh, to, you know, seek out scholarships and positions at their desired colleges. And lastly, I will discuss the barriers that our students face 
like our students, I'm first generation college student. I'm a first generation US citizen. I had another language spoken in my home. Um, and, you know, I bumped into the right people to ensure that, you know, I would be successful in my college journey and career. Um, but it shouldn't be up to fate for our students to determine if they're going to find success in the same ways. So the barriers listed uh, certainly impact our undocumented population, our first generation college going students, especially. And so our CCR task force is quite committed to, you know, considering the implications of these district policies, legislative decisions, budgetary outlooks for the future. And so we look forward to working with the board, our KCPS community, and, uh, you know, dealing with those other restrictions as we plan and expand our programs and ensure success for our students in their journey. Thank you. I'll turn over the presentation to Dr. Davis. All right, thank you, CCR team, uh, members of the board. You see that we have been intentional about using data and, and interrogating that data, not only to find out more about what we know, but also to determine what more uh, there is for us to know. You know, are there barriers, are there uh, obstacles that we need to uh, discover or find out that may be preventing uh, all students from achieving the same high outcomes? And so we are committed to continuing this work to make sure that we continue to do more of what is working. Uh, you saw a lot of our successes, but we also are very much aware of some areas where we want to see continued growth to ensure that all students who leave our system are college and career ready. And so uh, with that, we will open it up for any questions. Thank you, Dr. Davis and team. Any questions from the board? Check in with Ms. Ford. Oh, no? Okay. I have a question. Yeah, go ahead, Ms. Ford. Um, I don't know if y'all can see me. I'm not seeing myself on the screen, but I'm wanting to know if the district itself has uh, identified uh, how we how we define college and career ready. Is that some, is, can I find that somewhere? Yes. <clears throat> so we have taken a look at our data and uh, what we found is that even in looking at the uh, college going rates, we saw that some of our schools have really high percentages of students who are uh, going on to college. Other schools have 60% or so going on to uh, the workforce. And so what we know about college and career uh, readiness or being prepared is that not everyone is going to go straight to college right after school, I'm sure. Most of us in this, uh, many of us in this room have likely gone back to school, you know, even after uh, going to work. And so whether it's on your master's or a post-secondary degree, uh, even my, my father who taught in this district for 26 years, he didn't uh, receive his degree until he was 44. So he taught 26 years from age 44 to 70. And so, uh, so what we want is that every student is prepared for college or career that when they enter that workforce is not just say a minimum wage, but a livable wage. And so this is why we want to focus on uh, what Ms. Wynn was speaking to is our, we're gonna create a graduate profile. This is some of the work we'll be doing throughout this year. And these are the core competencies. This is, these are just some of the, our initial brainstorm, but we're going to engage principals. We wanna engage the board around what are the core competencies that every single graduate of our school system should leave so that we ensure that all of our programs are helping students to be able to advocate for themselves, be able to solve real world problems. So once we create that, that graduate profile, that will be our true definition and we will have a graphic that explains uh, uh, what college and career readiness, uh, college prepared, career prepared means in KCPS. Hey, Miss Miss Ford, if I can just add on to that. So we know that that's part of what we know we want to focus on here in our school district, but there's also a regional uh, focus. You heard about the Real World Learning Initiative, and one of the things that uh, that group of leaders are trying to tackle is how do you come up with a definition around college and career readiness that can be applied regionally um, so that we all have some type of common definition of uh, what those expectations are. So that is also a part of the real world learning uh, initiative too. 
Yes, and, and thank you, Dr. Bedell. And with the uh, goal that students leave with at least three market value assets, we are looking for students to leave our system with at least uh, nine college credits. There are other uh, factors that we have um, presented previously, but we will definitely re uh, uh, send that in a Friday update as well. And we will continue our work on the graduate profile. Mr. Abarca. Um, I, I want to start actually at where you just left off about the nine college credits thing. I think that's incredibly important. Um, one one uh, suggestion of my own experience, I graduated with 28 college credits, thought I was smart and decided to sign up for sophomore level courses. Mm -hmm realized very swiftly when I got to college, not only the sandbags of those grades that were supplemented in my GPA in high school, I would, they're not supplemented when I got to college and that would, would wreak havoc on my GPA for undergraduate and not being prepared. So um, I, I wanna throw that out as how do we also support our students as we transition if they're collecting these large sums of credits and likely taking out all of the, the balance that they would have in most semesters by using all their gen ed credits. Um, so that's something I hope that you look at in, in the mix of things. Mm -hmm. um, the, the real questions I had um, were back around um, the CCR component when dealing with undocumented students. I think mm -hmm. I've talked to Dr. Bedell about the reality that the state um, looks, at, looks at CCR, but if you're undocumented, you aren't able to get a driver's license for the state of Missouri you aren't able to work for the state of Missouri. And until there's federal legislation that creates more opportunities to make undocumented folks come out from the shadows, we are in, in essence holding KCPS at a disadvantage. The state is holding them at a disadvantage, us as a disadvantage, because these students are with us. And that has to be something DESE deals with um, to not have that burden on us and to help us empower the kids in our systems. Um, I, I was disappointed to see that our own policies here, that we're not doing the tracking um, for undocumented students. Is that correct? We're not tracking uh, primarily for, you know, I'll say, uh, I guess if we knew someone could likely come and mandate that we hand that over, uh, but it's not required that students or families provide a social security number. So that even though one could assume if we don't see a social security number that they could be undocumented, but not necessarily so. And, but because we don't, um, I'm, I'm sure people in the, sure. in the schools are more aware because of the personal stories that they're aware of with students, uh, they're able to provide uh, those uh, targeted supports, but through our SIS system, we are a actually able to know for certain so that we can provide uh, those supports. Under that, that second bullet, I know that uh, our, CTE team has shared that undocumented students will sign up for career and tech ed classes. And so they, they learn the core competencies, but the state does not allow for them to sit for the uh, industry recognized credential. So, so even though they have the knowledge, they don't, they don't leave our system with the actual uh, certificate so they can enter uh, the workforce. So there are some uh, barriers that we're working through and we hope to uh, come up with some some, some workarounds to support uh, the students we serve. I would love to see, uh, and this may be an, an action item potentially, what policies exist in California, the, the Southwestern states around undocumented students to balance what, exactly what you talked about, right? We don't want ICE and a terrible administration like the last one uh, to come and ask for these documents um, that we're holding um, and, and be the bearer of that engagement that we, we don't want to happen. But at the same time, creating opportunities and access for folks uh, is imperative, especially as we look at, you know, we've got Latino students who are probably a large majority of the folks who are going to be undocumented here, mm -hmm. outpacing some of the folks in these, these core um, areas of advancement, and, and we don't have a path for them to be successful. Um, even exploring externally as you go to Kansas, I mean, there's more opportunity, sadly, there because of their state than ours here. Mm -hmm. So I would love to see some, some follow-up on that. And, and we did in looking at our data out of 560 districts in the state of Missouri, we have the highest immigrant population in the state. And when we looked at number two, we have more than twice uh, the number of uh, who is in second uh, in the state. And so uh, our context is, is one that we do need uh, some support from the state level to look at how we can best serve uh, our students and how some of the current policies really work against our students' best interests. 
Okay. Um, a couple of questions for me. Um, how many industry partners do we have actively engaged with the district? Okay. I'm going to bring up <laughs> Dr. McNeil to uh, speak to that. <laughs> Nobody wants that question. <laughs> um, a lot. Uh, no. So I can, I can, uh, we have that, that detailed list. And so I can make sure that, uh, that we, we send that out. So I don't want to shoot from, from vamp, but I'll give you the exact number and who they are. Okay. And then how many, how many, well, and so maybe this will be another one as part of that is, uh, cause yeah, I don't want you to shoot from the hip either. Um, how many students are engaged with those partners? Um, again, we can, you can get that to us, um, with, at the same time. Um, I'm assuming you have that. Yes, sir. And then how do, how do partners know um, or do partners know how to engage with the district, um, you know, to, to become a potential partner? Sure. From, from the CTE standpoint. Uh, so what we do is, is a couple of different things. And so we, we engage the uh, business community. And so we seek out those opportunities in a number of different ways. One through, those advisory uh, committee meetings. So all of our CT uh, program pathways are required to have those advisory meetings with those industry folks, at least twice a year, one in the spring, one in the fall. And so we put that out information out there. We also actively engage them via our social media platforms and make those ads and engage the, uh, the business community as well. And so we partnered even um, this one of our partnerships that was developed through the Black Chamber of Commerce, um, partnering and piloting in a cybersecurity uh, pathway. And so we just create those opportunities and make it relatively easy for them. But then we also seek out those opportunities to figure out where are our skill gaps, what areas will we need, what's underrepresented, and really seek out those opportunities and really leverage uh, our relationships that the board has. And so that's how we how we do that. Just an important parcel. Okay. So if I'm a if I'm a random partner who for whatever reason wasn't part of the outreach or didn't know about the advisor committee and I wanted to engage, where would I find that information? So you can go to uh, to our website and um, and under our under our page and so being able to volunteer um it's also we send out the information via the newsletter but i think just to be quite honest we could do a better job of communicating that and making it relatively easy uh for our partners to uh to partner with us just to be honest okay no i i appreciate the transparency there it's one of the things that i consistently hear is that it's one i don't know how to engage with the district and when i do it's a challenge right and so i'm curious about you know what what's the timeline from initial inquiry to engage with the district and when they actually would become a partner? And do we understand what the criteria is to become a partner as well? Yeah, so for us, it's, it's, relatively, it's a relatively swift process. And so it depends on what level of engagement from the career and technical education standpoint, how they engage with them. And so whether it's a connector session, uh, that becomes relatively easy to do so in scheduling those pieces out. But if it requires a, a broader piece, then you have to kind of work through that process in terms of getting cleared through our volunteer services and all those pieces. And then really mapping out, particularly if we think it's something like a client connected project, how that looks and what's involved there and really working through the logistics around that. Because what we find is that there is, um, there's a number of people that wants to engage with us, but we have to make sure it's the right kind of relationship and the right kind of engagement. Mm -hmm. It's what do you want from us? And so is it, is it some data things that we can't, provide to you from the district perspective and, and student confidential information, what does it look like? But we try to be relatively um, responsive in terms of a turnaround time. I can, we're, we're a lot more responsive, but I haven't necessarily quantified that turnaround time. But anytime there's a scenario where a community or business partners in, engage with us in any way, we try to turn it around relatively quickly. Yeah, it would be interesting. And it sounds like you're not really tracking like your, your timelines, it, yes, it just, I think it'd be something good for you to, to track. Um, because if, if you want to go advertise this stuff out to industry partners or prospective partners, the more we can tell them, this is what the experience looks like. Here's what the criteria is to become a partner. Here's how we're going to engage with you. And when we're done, here's what you should get out of it, partner. Right. And, um, and we should demand things of these partners too, right? Like I completely agree with your point around, we're not gonna just accept anybody because everybody wants to partner with the district. <laughs> just because you wanna partner with us doesn't mean we should be, we should be partnering with you. Um, but you know, and things like, look, if you're gonna partner with us, you should provide paid internships to our kids, right? And so there's a whole bunch of things. I just think, I mean, I can't, I can't encourage you guys enough. Um, Dr. Bedell, I know you and I have talked about this for a long time. Like we have got to get clarity around this. I mean, you can do all the real world learning stuff and everything, but 
if these, if these kids don't have opportunities every single summer or through the year to go do this work directly, it's, it's going to fall short of the ultimate goal, which is having them ready, right, when they, when they leave our schools. And so we, we, we got to find a way to accelerate this particular component so that this community, the business community, knows what it's like and, and, and is willing and able to go engage with us. So, um, uh, Ms. Cortez. You said something that kind of sparked a piece that I would share with you, um, which is as part of a number of business groups here in town, I get emails periodically. In fact, I just got two this week from um, other school districts who are seeking you know, very specific opportunities. So one is through, one was from the Crossroads uh, Community Association, which is both businesses and residents in the Crossroads, right? Probably 600 businesses on that list that said, we're looking for companies that have communications projects that need to be, you know, that, that have the following attributes and need to be done in the following timelines with a contact. Um, and I'm surprised by the number of communications I get about that. And there are so many of those pathways available to us if we, if we can define with some degree of specificity what opportunities we're looking for for our kids. You know, if, if there are particular classes where we're looking for projects or looking for relationships, we just have to be specific about what we want. And then I think the business community can be more responsive in that way. So I had forgotten that I'd gotten those recently, but you said something that reminded me. And it's just, it's a very simple way to connect with kind of people who, who, can, who can work with our kids quickly. So. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. Yep, Dr. Jones. Uh, I agree with all of my colleagues' points and questions, and I just wanted to make a plug for public health because y'all keep talking about business. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, we are like screaming for people and not all of our requirements. So just thinking about the hiring that I'm, you know, having to work through right now, and so much of it just requires things like, you know, being bilingual or at least um, being willing to learn about public health because we have lost so many people in this pandemic to other fields who just got burned out. So just thinking about pub the public sector and public health. And so I, I know in the past we reached out, you know, we were trying to get something worked out um, right as COVID was hitting, but I would like to pick that work back up um, with the health department because we are definitely open to it. And I know the city has a whole bunch of initiatives. Now they're trying to be more supportive of youth in the city. So let's stay on that momentum. So. Yes, Happy to help with that. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. McNeil. All right. All right. Thank you. All right. That, you, that uh, concludes the superintendent's uh, report. Thank you, sir. All right. A couple of actually really one quick announcement for the board. So uh, MSBA's annual conference is coming up. Um, it is November 4th through the 7th. There's been, I'm sure you guys are subscribing to their emails. There's been so many emails, it's hard to really even keep track. So, I mean, it's just, yeah, information overload. However, a couple of things to note. So on November 4th, which is a Thursday, uh, McCown Gordon is hosting a, um, an event um, from four to eight. And then it, sort of an, a little bit of an overlap. So what I'm gonna try to do is go to that start there and then move over to the uh, more squared annual uh, transformation event, which is from six to nine. Uh, they're both downtown. So you should be able to walk from one to the other. I think Dr. Bedell, you're gonna try to split your time between those. Is that right? Between the, between the uh, McCown Gordon happy hour and the more squared event? No? Nope. It's fine, okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so. all right well so uh ignore everything i just said i mean i, I was, um yeah there's I think you're gonna there's do one some of other right? events i have to attend, okay that's so. fine yep no worries um <laughs> you're killing me here um okay uh on the on november 5th which is a friday um this is absolutely right and you have to be there for this dr bedell um dr bedell and dr collier are leading a uh one of the current sessions um, at the conference from 2.15 to 3.15. So please show up and support our superintendent and deputy superintendent for that. Um, and then from 4.30 to 7.30, J.E. Dunn is hosting a happy hour um, event uh, for that night. 
Yeah, yeah please. So I know um, the all of the uh, districts that are doing these on-site tours um, that happen on Thursday, hours would go from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. and um, yeah. MSBA wants these uh, leaders to take a look at, at some of our like non-traditional type programs, programs that could potentially be replicated uh, in other districts. So we will have um, a tour of the middle college, a tour of the early college academy. We'll have uh, manual, manual tech, yep, because we stopped by there. And we're gonna also take uh, a group over to the African-centered um, college prep program lower. Um, and those will be the four sites. But then what they want us to do on Friday, each of these three school districts, because there will be a number of people that won't be able to, 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 to meet the uh, size requirements to do these visits, they want us to do breakout sessions. And in those breakout sessions, that's also our opportunity to, to highlight these programs, potentially share data around these programs and the difference that these programs are making. So that's what the uh, breakout session will focus on on Friday. All right, so that was just a quick announcement. Um, and then I think what we're gonna do now is turn the mic over to Ms. Wolfsey for um, legislative agenda. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I am trying to blank if it was last meeting that I presented the legislative priorities or if it was two meetings ago, but I know um, that uh, we have brought the legislative priorities forward in a draft form and had asked for uh, feedback, not only from my board colleague um, friends, but also from the general public, uh, asking that we would have that by the 8th so that we could go ahead and adopt these priorities tonight. And that's mainly because the sooner we can do so, the sooner we can start working um, with legislators ahead of time um, before the actual session begins in January. So um, I just want to let everybody know I didn't get a lot of feedback, and that's not a bad thing. It, we're, I, I'll just remind everybody that um, we, it typically takes a couple of times to get something through uh, a priority um, started and then across the finish line. We came very close last year. Um, but I would like to, um, I, I do want to make a point that at the last meeting, when I had uh, presented the draft that one of the, uh, one of the priorities was around the social and emotional needs of underserved communities, which in the government relations committee itself, we had discussed possibly dropping that one, um, both uh, administration and board members in that committee. However, it was brought to our attention that this actually is one of the uh, priorities that our students and our parents, families and community can get behind. So I don't think since I didn't get a lot of real like, no, we got to drop it. I don't think it's any skin off our nose to just go ahead and keep this one and maybe use it as our jumping off point for uh, advocacy, um, really a good hook for them. So um, I'm going to recommend, or our group would recommend that we leave that. And so at this point, um, I don't think I need to reread them. I think they're in the front of your uh, folder. So I'd like to recommend that the board adopt the Kansas City Public Schools 2022 legislative um, priorities as presented. Second. All right, it's been moved and so you're you're making the motion, correct? Okay, yep. So it's been moved and seconded. Jen, will you uh, please call the roll? Mr. Barca? Yes. 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 Ms. Ford, can you hear us? Yes. Hi. Yes. Yes. Mr. Yes, the motion passes. Thank you, Ms. Wolfsey. All right, so June, will you do a quick review of the new action items, please? Okay, so uh, Ms. Dr. Jones, pardon me, um, I had a question on the ombudsman report. 
in the update, which is done monthly. And she would like to know um, the nature and how are the issues resolved? I believe she sent a lengthy email to Dr. Bedell. Lengthy. <laughs> thorough. <laughs> a thorough email. That's better, yes. And um, so we will get that answered for you. Uh, Mr. Abarca would like to um, know what are the policies that exist in like California or Arizona for undocumented students and for what is providing a path for them to be successful? How are they, how are they doing that? Uh, Mr. Hogan asked, um, let's go. Okay, do partners know how to engage with the district to become a potential partner? And where does that information exist? The other question was, what are, is there a list of industry partners and how many students are engaged with these partners? Did I miss anything? Mr. Abarca. The, the only thing I was gonna say in addition is to making sure that those policies balance the, um, the potential of uh, data mining, I guess, for lack of better terms, um, for the undocumented students' names. And so making sure those policies that that balance or protect um, some of that. And that might require some legal background as well, so. Right, right, right. Um, if I may, um, if you are going to the Moore Square event, I need to know that now. And um, if you want to go for on any of the tours to the schools, please let me know because I need to make reservations for you for MSBA conference. Thank you. So I'll be at the Moore Square event. <laughs> Um, uh, I, and Mr. Abarca is going to be there. I'll be there. Dr. Jones, Ms. Wolfsey, and uh, Ms. Buckner is going to be there. Ms. Ford, will you be able to make that? Question mark. I'll let you know shortly. Okay. Okay. Thank Perfect. You. Okay. All right. Anything else, June? Okay. Thank you. All right. Um, I think that was the last item right before Dr. Bedell, you had a final yeah. remark. Yeah. Just two things before I go to the um, agenda items, just um, I do want to congratulate you, Mr. Hogan, um, being named the uh, Moore Square 2021 Equity Park Partner of the Year. So that's a huge accomplishment. I very appreciative of just the number of uh, acknowledgements that that many of you all are, are getting here uh, serving on as board directors and your impact in this community. And I think there's just just one other thing I want to say. And, you know, we we've been talking a lot about how do we today was a lot about college and career readiness. And what do we do to make sure that these kids have um, fair opportunities to be able to access whatever their dreams are. And I know. Um, you know, he probably doesn't want me to say this, but Mr. Hogan, you know, started a scholarship fund, um, $10,000, no GPA requirement. And these kids can apply and have an opportunity to get 2000 or so dollars of their tuition taken care of um, in their first year of entering into school. So just want to make sure that I you know, on the topic of what we've talked about tonight with college and career readiness, just make sure that I publicly acknowledge that and just say thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bedell. I appreciate it. All right. All right. And then the last thing I want to do is share with you all the agenda items, the business items for next meeting. Um, we're going to ask the board to take action on cornerstones of care for an amount of 700000 Mark Head Start, uh, $5,045,885. Mark Early Head Start for $336,909. And then Northwest Rogers, which is the um, Child Nutrition Services Cold Storage Units in the amount of $1,013,280. And there is one item that's not up here that we, will, that we possibly will bring to the board, and that is those um, funding MOUs. Uh, with the charters. Great. All right. I guess with that, we are adjourned. Thank you, guys.